So hello and welcome to our first digital transformation community of practice webinar. Uh, the idea behind the COP community of practice is to provide a space for, I would say, a thoughtful conversation around digital transformation and higher education. And I would also want to say that uh, I'm just recovering from a bad flu. Uh, so that's why I have this baritone voice today. So if, if I do break into a uh, cough, just pardon me. Uh, so uh, let's just get started. A few housekeeping items for all of us. Uh, you know, please introduce yourself in the chat. It is such an amazing uh, way to just get to know each other. Uh, let us know where you are from. Uh, please mute your microphone if you're not speaking, so that there's no, uh, you know, uh, confusion or uh, you know, noise kind of while we're having these amazing discussions. Uh, use the chat to ask any questions. We will be monitoring and moderating it. And towards the end of the webinar, uh, the idea is to have around 15 minutes for our interactive uh, session. And we will try to address most of your questions. As I just said, that today's uh, webinar is being recorded. H however, we will stop the recording just before the Q&A session. And uh, a link to presenter slides, so we do have an amazing presenter today, uh, is being posted into the meeting chat. And uh, Laura will be adding that uh, the link uh, for your reference. Uh, okay, uh, I would like to begin by uh, spending some time on uh, my land acknowledgement. I would like to honor and acknowledge that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, intuits, and methods. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First People of this land. I join you today from Toronto, which is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize the work done by nine Indigenous institutes in this province. The Indigenous institutes are a key pillar of Ontario's post-secondary ecosystem. And as a member of the sector, I want to recognize and share their incredible leadership for Indigenous owned and led education. Uh, please learn more about them with the additional links that will be put in your chat, that will be added to your chat. Um, Okay, so hello and welcome once again uh, to the first Digital Transformation Community of Practice webinar. And the topic for today is the importance of change management in digital transformation initiatives. A very, very exciting and a very relevant topic, I would say. Uh, so a little bit about myself. My name is Monica Shah and I am a Digital Transformation Associate on the research and foresight team at eCampus. And uh, here I work primarily on running uh, the leadership for transformation for digital transformation micro credential. We'll be talking about that throughout uh, this webinar. And it gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce our main presenter for today. Uh, joining us today from University of Toronto Scarborough is Adon Irani. Adon is a manager at the Center for Teaching and Learning, University of Toronto Scarborough, where he oversees the design, development, implementation, operation, and support of edtech and pedagogical technology solutions. Adon will share his experience supporting and leading innovations at a campus of 14,000 students. And Adon is also a learner of our first cohort for this micro-credential. Uh, a little bit about eCampus Ontario for somebody who's new to uh, eCampus. eCampus Ontario is a provincially funded nonprofit organization that leads a consortium of the province's publicly funded colleges, universities, and indigenous institutes to advance the use of educational technology and digital learning environments. Our membership includes 53 institutions in this province. Our members are faculty, administrators, student support services, registrar's office, teaching assistants, and learners. Uh, we actually welcome anyone involved in post-secondary education in Ontario to come find the right opportunity for them. 
Okay, uh, so just to get the discussion rolling, and because we are here, we're talking about uh, digital transformation. Uh, I just want to throw a poll question. Uh, Laura, if you could just launch the poll question. Uh, this is just inspired by uh, a whole on IQ workshop that I had attended. And um, okay, and let me just move it here so that all of us can see. So the question is, how's your DX journey looking? And uh, Wow, that's interesting. Hmm, so this is changing rapidly. And it says that, wow, ooh, we've made a start is already at 50%. We're right in the thick of it. So this is amazing. I would say uh, this just kind of makes it why this topic about digital, why it is so important to have this community of practice to talk about digital transformation, because as the poll shows that, most of us have either made a start or we are right there. We've already are on the digital transformation journey. Uh, so let me just end the poll and I will just get to the next slide, which is, uh, so why, why are we talking about, um, you know, uh, eCampus and what is this whole connection between digital transformation and eCampus? So at eCampus, we understand that higher education is in the era of digital transformation where institutions are redefining how we teach and learn. And digital transformation, or as you can see, DX, is far more than simply adopting a new technology or supporting online education. Instead, what we are looking at is an infusion of digital tools into complex education systems that can transform an institution's operations, uh, strategic directions and value proposition. And successfully navigating digital transformation also requires a unique vision, perspective and set of leadership skills. Ecampus is committed to fostering digital, uh, digital transformation in the province's higher education sector by providing digital by design platforms, programs, and services. That said, we understand that DX is not necessarily, it's not a straightforward journey and that there are challenges. And we need to discuss those challenges and identify solutions. Uh, the, the main objective behind creating this DX community of practice is, uh, you know, we thought that we need to have a platform where we can have meaningful conversations around digital transformation and higher education. So for the remainder of today's webinar, we will hear from Adorn, who will share with us the digital transformation of their institution's exam support model through the right kind of change management uh, process. And as I just said at the onset, that this will be followed by the Q&A section. So now I will stop talking and I will stop sharing my screen and I will pass it over to Adon. So the stage is all yours, Adon. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Monica. Can I just do a quick um, sound check and visual check? Is everything coming through okay? Perfect. So thank you so much, um, everyone. This has been, I mean, everyone, just eCampus Ontario, but also the all the Ontario you know, college and university members here that are uh, committed to this because it's it's important work and it's difficult work. And what I wanted to share today is maybe two two real key kind of things. One is my experience with the um, with this digital transformation cohort. I, I was part of the first cohort, so I, I've kind of glean some some lessons learned and, and put them in the slides just to give you a sense of you know the value and the the you know excellent um, conversations that we were we had in the first cohort and, and you'd have in, in future cohorts and then the second thing is just to give you a bit of a picture of um, how change worked um, from my experiences and I'm going to give you some um, three different pictures of change so what I, I'm covering a lot of ground here um, we've got you know, the, the 30 minutes, I'm just going to actually, I should start my countdown so I can keep on time. And I, I will be covering a lot of uh, ground, uh, but then we've got a good 15 minutes of, of Q&A at the end. So my, my intention here is to kind of paint a picture that maybe feels, um, you know, common to, to some of your experiences and then allow us to really get into, um, into detailed conversation. Uh, but I also want to, as in doing that, I wanted to kind of 
really speak to the variety of, of change. And I, I put in my little insert here of the right kind of change management because change is difficult. And, and I have three different examples. So the first one is looking at sort of traditional change processes. And this is the standard stuff that you would expect to um, encounter. And I'll give you a story of, of that. And then I'll give a story of emergent change where the traditional process is really, um, I would say we're mal-suited for, for what was required and what um, you know, the, the demands that were, um, we were being confronted with during the pandemic. So I'll give you a, sort of some insight into what did change look like under those conditions. And then we'll, we'll come back to this kind of um, help uh, returns and we're, we're back into sort of a restoration of um, change process Again, looking at change from multiple perspectives. Um, and for this, I brought in this, um, it's my favorite framework. It's, it's, I mean, 35 years old now, probably 1995, or oh, I did my math wrong, but it's, it's aged, but it's aged well. And, and my goal with this is really just to give us some, um, a, a bit of a tool to identify different change processes. And the thing about this is, I always come back to building community. That's always my reference point. And, and building community is the most difficult thing ever. And it's not something you can kind of do stepwise. I, I, I really find it's, um, it's sort of this amorphous kind of process that you go in that at the end, maybe you've got stronger bonds and this kind of you know, healthy culture. But to, to get there, um, it's not clear stepwise kind of progression. But with change, especially change management, we want that proper stepwise um, progression. And why I draw on this, this framework, uh, these are ideal change models from biological and social sciences. And this is a, a management science. And, and it, it's an incredible article if you, if you take a look at it. Um, I, I, my goal today is really just to use this as a, a reference point. But the two key things here, um, if you look at the, the, the types, the units of change and the mode of change, is it the single entity? So from the, our um, context, is it you know, the entire institution? Is it the entire campus? Um, or is it you know, as a whole, like as a strategic kind of whole? Um, or is it within sort of at the, the MISO level of intra-departmental and where there's multiple different stakeholders? And obviously when you're thinking of change at the full campus level, strategic level, there's also multiple entities, but the change is happening at a, um, you know, the larger context, whereas some of um, a lot of the change that I'll also share today is happening kind of at a, a, a smaller scale. You know, it's out happening with in between departments. So these are just different models I'll kind of refer back to um, to give some context. But the first story I had was around looking at our change management under sort of traditional processes and thinking about what did it mean prior to the pandemic to ask the question of how do we want to deliver um, or, or support the delivery of exams? And some facts on the screen here, you, you may be in similar um, situations, you know, we're a decent sized campus, uh, over 14,000 students, over 100,000 in total with U of T, but at the Scarborough campus, it's, um, you know, it's about 14 or over 14,000. And predominantly we're an in-person institution. So all of our exams would also be predominantly run on uh, in person and there was a business case or a, you know a, a desire to to look at that and say well is this how we want to forever run exams are there situations where we want to be able to run digital exams uh, there were situations for instance in um, in accounting or computer science where they, they were really uh, relying on digital exams but didn't have the infrastructure so this is kind of a traditional context that you might encounter where you've got these kind of goals. We want to administer exams with increased efficiency. Um, so some talk around having a, like a computerized exam center, you know, would that be um, a, a plus for the institution? There, there's a lot of factors there. So it's an open question. Um, but the other side to this was, and it's coming from the vision of our dean, it, it was really saying, well, we have students that are not strong with cursive writing. Uh, they, they may not have been doing much cursive writing for much of their um, school career. They come into um, university courses where a lot of their coursework is done on computers, you know, not 
there's exceptions, but it's it's a lot of work coursework done on computers. And then they come into this exam and they have to write for three hours. And and the, the greetability, the, the readability, uh, but also just the comfort for the students and to have that alignment of the assessment modes that they're experiencing during the semester align with the assessment mode of the, the final exam. And being able to have typed essay exams was uh, identified as something that would, would have value. So this is sort of the context. And, and with this, this is your kind of traditional evolutionary model. So um, we, we had a project champion, you know, the dean saw the need and, and really wanted to um, serve our students and get in front of this and think about, well, what steps could we take to, um, to bolster up our exam delivery uh, models? And we followed your traditional project management um, methodologies. So, you know, it's this kind of evolutionary story where there's a variation in the sense of um, we're going to, you know, I've got a little a diagram here to, to lay it out. So we kind of said, okay, well, there's there's a problem here. We want to do something about it. So there, there was this kind of variation where we'd say, okay, well, we're going to have this, this project charter. We're going to call together. And then, but it was uh, the type of change. I'll just go back a second here. It was prescribed. This wasn't this um, constructive kind of open-ended process where, you know, any outcome is possible and we just really are open to um just this open-ended discovery. Well, no, this is a formal project charter uh, that went through your standard kind of um, process, and and using the the tools that you you know one would would expect. Um, and if you're not familiar with these kind of tools, there's likely people in your institution that that do project management, and they're wonderful to work with, and you kind of go through this process. So the selection part was really saying, okay, well, we're we're gonna put a pilot in place, you know, they, they had a steering committee to, to really um, steer the, uh, you know, discuss and improve strategic directions. And then we come up with this uh, pilot where we we test out these tools, very fulsome process. I'm, I'm summarizing it just in the interest of time. But the end result was this retention. And the idea was after this pilot, after a successful pilot, it has to be one that, that gets endorsed and then, you know, and it did, something has to actually change. And in this regard, it was how then once we have this proven capability to deliver exams this way, how do we roll it out um, beyond the pilot and, and reach multiple courses, support students, support faculty? Um, there's access issues here. What if a student, it's a digital exam, what if they don't have a laptop to write on? Thousands of different considerations, but all of which kind of follow. So there was this change process where we did the, the pilot, came out the other end with, Here's a model that that we like has been met with funding, um, sort of baseline funding, and then it's handed off to my team to to run with. So now there's this established service running for digital exams. Um, so this is an example of a um, you know sort of this evolutionary story and and a very common one that you'd encounter. So I'm going to give you two others because um, I think it's useful to see change working in different uh, ways. These are sort of different motors that. Um, that are operating within your institutions. Um, and of course, I, I really wanted to pull back to the cohort, the course that we um, had. This is a, a quote from the, the module three, um, Ecosystems Ideator. Uh, so uh, digital transformation leaders recognize that existing pedagogy and programs can serve as a great platform to build from and recognize that new delivery and evaluation methods um, can benefit their stakeholders to absorb and apply the knowledge, skills, and abilities. So a lot of what um, what we accomplished through this this project, you know, there was funding. There's some external stuff that had to come in, but the, you know, the stuff of the, you know, the workings with which we created the solution were all capabilities that were in house, and and we were able to kind of through this process arrange the organization to um, to be able to act in this way, and and we've run hundreds of exams, um, it's been very successful. That's one example, and then. I wanted this one's a bit of a, a real insight into the inner workings. And again, my, my goal here is just to give us some, um, you know, a framework to, to bring into our conversations. So with the onset of the pandemic, again, we're in an in-person institution. So there's all these new challenges that were coming out, uh, pressure manifesting in places that, you know, a lot of new dotted lines coming to me from places where work never 
demands never came from before. And then here I'm, you know, encumbered with, with a lot of support requests, urgent ones. Um, and what was happening is we had these service models that were well um, appropriate to the service they were delivering, but they were on the, the, the assumptions were now changed. You know, we were now delivering on online exams, for instance. And, and so this changed the business needs and required this kind of urgent, agile um, solutions. And, and this is, again, I, I really want to come back to these change stories because this one was one that created conflict. So we had um, these multiple blazing fires, you know, it's the onset of the pandemic. A lot of things were um, needing you know, a lot of attention and, and how we, we didn't sort of lack the mechanisms to provide that support. Or if you think about the first change story, that was well planned. It was sort of prescribed. There's a, you know insight and foresight in, in how we're going to approach. You know how do we crack this nut? Well, in this case, the problems weren't even identified. Like it, it was, we have units that are used to doing things a certain way, and now the next step that they would take is no longer possible. It's like the the, you know, the bridge is out from under them. What do we do in this context? So this really led to a conflict. Like it was the the thesis is like we're a healthy, well-running operation, but the antithesis is, except now for us to complete the work that we need to do, there's this external dependency and no clear um, understanding over how this work's going to get done or even what new workflows are required to support this kind of work. So it creates this kind of conflict. Um, the end result is synthesis. And, and this, is, this is kind of a, I think, a fun one. I, the next slide's a little scary. Uh, or the one after this, but um, I want to give you a picture of what that synthesis actually looked like because I think it's a really, um, you know, just uh, just sharing from from my experiences might be helpful for for some of you or for those of you who are, have had similar experiences and are recovering. Uh, maybe this is a good you know touch point as this community of practice. We, it's a safe place for us to to support one another. Um, this is a specific example with with online deferred exams you would have situations where a student legitimately is unable to write the exam. Um, maybe there's a scheduling conflict. Maybe there's a sickness. These situa situations happen and, and they're predicted. So students have a, a workflow through which they can say, well, I legitimately um, you know, missed my exam and I need to, to take a deferred. And there's a process through that. And there's a whole team that handles it and they're lovely. They, they, there's a thousand steps that they're, um, responsible for to, to provide this service. And they always did it with excellence. And then the pandemic hits. And now all of a sudden we have a backlog of initially about 500, but it, over the pandemic, we had about 2000 um, of these deferred exams online, uh, not just individual students, but exams. So there's, there's more than 2000 students um, writing. This is a lot of students impacted. But what would happen then is there was just no process to administer these online um, exams. And that, that was a problem. You know, we have a department that, again, that conflict, that antithesis of, well, we're, we, we operate in excellence, but now for us to do the steps that we do, they'd be insufficient, you know, through no fault of their own, this, the conditions change. Bottom is no longer um, under them. So this is a little scary slide coming up, but this is what synthesis looked like. And, and I, I really chose this diagram um, purposefully, because I think it's really important. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but the thing was, what I'm trying to show here is this, this was not a job for traditional change processes. I mean, I would have loved that. I mean, I, if when this happened, we just could say, well, let's pause for, you know, six months, we're going to engage your project management office. They're wonderful. They'll do our project um, requirements and really come through We'll do a pilot, all this kind of stuff that we saw in the first act. Well, there wasn't time for that. And we had hundreds of students that were kind of waiting for, for this service to be restored. So this diagram is where we ended up. Um, we did not start there. Um, it was that kind of antithesis of, well, what do we do here? And if uh, there's sort of three tiers here to the, the diagram. So the first one's the registrar's office who is responsible for, for these services. Then there's the faculty, you know, they registers work very closely with the faculty and academic departments to, this is a deferred exam. So the, it's the prof's exam. We need to get the exam from the prof. 
and then the, the registrar's office would administer, well, now administration, administering of the exams online. So what we had then is this new line where my team, and initially me, because my team was at full capacity and these processes didn't exist, but we were now implicated in these service models. So how can we coordinate all of these moving parts and have, you know, continue to walk in excellence? And that was an incredibly difficult um, problem to, to, to resolve. And what I, I just want to really summarize this because the way it ended up working, I, I think was just beautiful. Um, but it all started with getting the um, a primary list um, of all of the exam requests with the appropriate data attached to it. Now, this is coming from our student information system. It has to align with our learning management system. Those are two different systems. They have a course code in common, but there's a lot of variations that, that prevent that from being a simple mapping. So all this technical stuff that I know in my brain is just difficult. Um, but the people I'm supporting, they don't really care about those details. They just want to know how can we serve our students. So is this kind of initial effort of how can I coordinate and, and communicate the meeting? And these are all techniques that, that come up in the, um, the cohort, the, the course that we were talking about, you know, empowering this group so that when they interact and we go to the second step, so basically they get a list of all the, the course requests in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet that's clean, that has, you know, data in the right places. Now, that was a big piece. Once that happens, then I've written all of these processes that basically take the schematic information and programmatically communicate to our learning management system and automatically set up the course shells. Um, so if you imagine we ran 2,000 of these, automated now, it takes maybe one minute um, for the a script to set up the course shell in the correct way. Well, had we been doing it manually, it would have been maybe 10, 15 minutes effort um, to set up. So there's a 10x, 100x multiplier on efficiencies by automating. And then it allows us to kind of focus our effort on what um, information does the team need in order to, to submit these requests to my team so that we're able to, to have this kind of smooth value, value flow. So this kind of goes back and forth between the responsibilities of the team. But what we're able to do from this was at the point when the communication goes out to the faculty saying, hey, it's time to set up your courses, well, the course is ready for them. And then my team, the EdTech team, we've got a forum that faculty can just kind of select a time and then an EdTech is going to be available to, to meet with them, which is the um, step four, basically. So it's kind of going through this loop where the people who are responsible for their part are able to do just their part within this kind of workflow. And then I'm generating reporting throughout so that the registrar's office knows which exams have been set up and which haven't. So they're able to do their follow-up. And there's just this smushing together of all this craziness into this clean diagram that now my team and the, the team in the registrar's office are really kind of well aligned on and where this took up so much of uh, my daily focus initially because these systems didn't exist. Now it's very much hands-off and, and my team uh, is able to anticipate where something doesn't fit this flow, and then we're able to identify and deal with it. So there's a lot of learning and knowledge that goes into this, but it was really a daily kind of grind just through relationships, through, you know, not always successfully, and, and really just trying to bring everyone together in a technical workflow that ensures the students get the support that they need. And, and it's hugely complicated, but it's a very different orientation to change than it was in, in the first act. Um, and I'll show, I'll soon get to the third act where this is actually now kind of replaced by traditional change. It's this interesting interplay. So I'm hoping this is kind of helpful just for, for those of you that have had similar experiences and we just have a good group cry after, or if it's just, uh, you know, maybe you're on the outside of change and you're wondering where some of the, you know, difficulties are coming from. It's hopefully this is sort of a, a helpful expose. Uh, so there's a lot of lessons learned here. And, and one of them was that for this online deferred exam delivery, it was really ad hoc. Um, it required this urgent rethink. Uh, the standard project management toolkit, it was really not adapted for these kind of emerging requirements. It, it could have been, but it would have taken longer. Maybe in hindsight, it would have been still um, if we had the resources to do that. But it was a crisis um, situation and, and we had to act fast. And, and the key is um, 
if we don't have that kind of formal protection of the project management plan and, and those kind of methodologies, we don't have executive sponsorship. We really come into these challenges where it's the, the role of the change agent to communicate that meaning and really line everyone up. And, and sometimes, again, there's the antithesis, the conflict. It's not always people don't like to be <laughs> lined up. They might just want to do things the way that they're used to doing it. And that really requires a set of skills that uh, I'm pleased to say our, our DX course um, really delves into um, in some useful ways. So just to close this out for uh, uh, some wisdom from the, D D the DX course. Uh, so this is from module two. And a change agent demonstrates empathy and understanding of the impact of change around them and continues to champion and sustain efforts until the goal is met. And, and this was so true in this context. It's just a continuous effort. Um, digital transformation change agents and innovators help um, public sector educators, uh, stakeholders to think differently about how and why, or why and how their institution classroom or non-academic programs can evolve um, digitally and for the better. Um, we inspire action, which is nice. Uh, yeah, wonderful quote. Um, so I, I, I'll wrap things up. Um, let's have a few minutes left. Oh, I've got one more ideal change type here. And this is, I, I call this the help arise. And I'm having a little fun with this. Um, I mean, the, the sequencing, the way I've, I, there's a bit of a retelling, um, sort of a re-dramatization of, you know, it's a historic retelling in a dramatic fashion as opposed to, you know, strictly um, re, you know, based in the, the reality. I'm having a little fun in this, but for the purposes of, of as I said, just to open up discussion and, and um, hopefully you know, give you something that resonates with some of your experiences. So th there's taking a step back, the, the picture I want to paint here is, so imagine through the pandemic, all this, like we're all under um, underwater, like it's just a very difficult time. And at the same time though, all of our, institutional motors, like think of these as big gears that are spinning, these things are still moving, maybe at a slow, slower speed than you'd like, but they're moving. And with that, you've got this kind of teleological cycle here where, you know, there, there's clear dissatisfaction, like the, you know, I, our staff, we need to work within labor laws, and we did, I mean, you know, the, the, we, we have to. Um, but we were really coming up against limits. And, and, you know, as a manager, I was trying to fill those gaps and, you know, it was well known that this was an unsustainable situation, but how we respond to, I mean, it was kind of on incumbent on me in that act to, to come up with a solution that was appropriate to the stakeholders I was supporting, but at a bigger institutional perspective, we've got uh, planning cycles where there's an annual, annual budget allocation, for instance, and, there's the you know resource allocation that requires this high level um, picture of the institution, and this is what I'm referring to here. So, you know, we we had all of this stuff happening, all these pressures on the, the our institutions, but then you've got people that really care about the institution looking you know very you know, in in detail at where we're at and thinking, well, what do we need? So. Um, with respect to online exam delivery, one big change that came out of this, um, you know, when the budget cycle sort of caught up, we increased the size of red tech team. Um, our student help desk has has more now. A lot of that's casual staff, but the composition also changed. They added some different staff roles, so that's um, it, it's increased to meet the demand. Whereas prior to the pandemic, we could operate on a smaller um, size team. During the pandemic, that put credible pressures, um, and and so then through this kind of, you know, search cycle where we're we're looking at over time over these kind of annual cycles, we've, uh, uh, you know, corrected the the staffing levels or brought them to appropriate current levels, and then we've also and I should have the point on here we've also invested in a lot of um, technology around the. Um, so we're using ServiceNow for ticketing, and we've got Office 365 with Teams and all these kind of capabilities now that we're using um, behind the scenes to equip our various teams to, to work together. So when there's a triage that uh, maybe comes to the student help desk, but has an ed tech component to it, behind the scenes, we're able to bring all this together. So uh, all of this kind of happened because I was able to get you know appropriate resources and then work with the, the staffing to really build systems. And, and, and so this is a 
different kind of change process. Um, and, and with the deferred exams, a lot of this actually now through central IT and I'm close to wrapping up, um, they've implemented some um, system enhancements that allow them to collect exams in a way that pretty much allows us to bypass the need for the online exam. However, there's still one big thing and other institutions may be um, encountering this. In the past for accommodations, we would have students who might request a remote access uh, accommodation to an exam or to the lectures. And in the past, we might say, well, we're, we're not equipped to do that. Like we just didn't have the, for remote access to a course, yes, but to the exam, you know, it wasn't always the case. But through the pandemic, we through, again, the, the work like this that created these workflows that allow us to operate in these ways that um, are more expedient and, and, and to, the, to the needs, we've kind of proven that we can operate in this way. So now these workflows may be deep, um, you know, deprioritized from online deferred exams because that, that service model now kind of goes back to a more um, sustained model. But for the students that require um, accommodations where it's an approved accommodation, well, we have that flexibility and that the teams are now sort of trained to in, interact in these ways um, to deliver that capacity. So there's all of this additional benefits that come from, um, you know, that, that sort of act two, the, the ad hoc change, which now really kind of comes into full um, force that, that we've got, um, you know, this kind of more strategic now allocation of resources. Uh, there's better alignment with, with their service needs. And then all the learning um, gets incorporated and, and we can kind of build on that. Um, so just to sum up, I've got a, a wisdom drop from our the DX course. This is the, the, the final mo module of the DX manager. Um, so our digital transformation leaders recognize that the change they're driving requires analysis and measurement uh, to effectively iterate through the project life cycle. Um, so they're clear about measuring their inputs as well as the outputs of their efforts to efficiently redesign institutional programs and services. A DX manager is an analytical leader who's informed by data and measurement um, as the foundation for future decisions. So DX managers relentless in their pursuit of the vision um, using best practices of project management. So um, that's the my concluding, um, you know, that, that was the, what I wanted to share. And just to, to sum up, I really just wanted to reiterate how wonderful of, of a program this was and that uh, the knowledge that I gained from was really useful, but having the uh, opportunity to connect with, with colleagues and, and really kind of have those collegial discussions, I found just to be, it filled a gap. I, I really you know appreciated that. And, and I can imagine others are maybe in a similar place where you're just still kind of shaking off the challenges that you've been carrying for the last several years. And you know, maybe, maybe you want someone to talk to. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass back to Monica, but thank you so much. And I, I really did find this to be a you know, genuinely useful program and um, so excited to be a part of it moving forward. Wow, thanks Adon. I mean, this was so engaging. I myself learned so much. Uh, maybe you could just stop sharing your screen and we are good with time. So. You know what, the, the main idea of this is to have a conversation. So I would just open the floor, uh, just raise your hands, ask questions and Adon and we, wherever we can answer, we're here to have this conversation. Or even if you want to share anything about your experience with, chair, uh, with change management, the floor is just open and yeah.